All right, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry we're running in uh, last minute. Uh, typical style, as you'll see called out later in the slides. Uh, we, we don't show up on time, ever. All right, so math puns, weapons of math instruction and mass destruction, uh, presented by Sean Iron, Failing Guan. Next slide, please. Agenda, we're going to talk through our bios because we always do that at conferences and then we'll do our obligatory disclaimer followed by a sketch of what we wanted to accomplish with this and then we're going to talk a lot about science, mathematics, nerd stuff and then we're going to draw some hopefully operational insights that both the red team and the blue team can use from this and then one of my former co-workers is going to judge me really hard at the end of this talk and make fun of me. Next slide, please. Bios. Um, I'm Sean. I'm the CEO of Arakia Security Company. We provide cybersecurity services to people who do counter sex trafficking. Uh, I'm also a Pythonista, an O-Center. I do a lot of judo and jujitsu, so that pretty much describes me. And Phelan can introduce himself. Would you guys prefer me to do this, or can you guys hear me now? Okay, cool. Hey, yeah. I'm Phelan Guan. Uh, I'm a uh, grad student at uh, Georgia Tech doing analytics, uh, data analytics and stuff, so I kind of did the data science portion of this talk. All right. None of the views or opinions uh, communicated in this talk. Also, make sure your, your camera mic is unmuted. Do you have one? Put this on. Okay. Put this on so the camera can hear you. None of the views in this talk reflect our current employer, uh, past, past employers, current employers, or future employers. Next slide, please. All right, so we had an idea. So we know that advertisers, ISPs, and a whole bunch of other companies collect telemetry on all sorts of users on the internet and then also on devices as you're walking through stores. So what's happening is when you're, when you're browsing the internet, your ISP is collecting net flow on you and they're mining your DNS information to build some sort of profile on you whether they know your particular name or not, so they can then serve stuff back to you. When you go to Amazon, you're interacting with tracking cookies and Google's doing tracking cookies and everyone is constantly fighting for your data so that they can find ways to monetize that data. On top of that, when you pull out your little personal tracking device, right, and you leave your Wi-Fi on when you leave your house, your handset is beaconing out saying, are you my mommy? And then all the other WAPs around them are saying, no, but thank you for asking me that question because I've got a, an orchestrated Wi-Fi platform in my department store that allows me to turn that well-signatured signal into an idea of how you're walking through the department store and I can combine that with video footage, et cetera. So the overall idea here is everyone else is collecting telemetry and they're not open sourcing the code on how they're analyzing it. So can we collect telemetry on Wi-Fi in a way that doesn't violate the CFAA, uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for those unfamiliar, and then turn that into some sort of insight using math that we can then share back to the community to get people thinking about if I don't have thousands of dollars, how can I turn things like signals that are all around me into something that I can help my SOC with or help my red team with. So we wanted to figure out ways to collect the data. Um, pretty straightforward, pretty well documented process. Apply math to it. Uh, increasingly well documented but still kind of nebulous on the Googles. Draw insights out of it and then apply those insights back to red and blue team. Next slide please. Really, we're, we're taking is the scientific method and just kind of applying math to it. So we're going to collect data. In this case, we're going to get like time, uh, the SSIDs, MAC addresses, and whatnot. We are going to then clean the data and package it in a nice form factor that we can do some math, uh, math analytics. We'll do some exploratory analysis where we kind of look at it and just do a quick like sanity check. Like, hey, does this look like we can actually understand anything intuitively? Uh, then we'll finally get to like the actual like math pieces. Like, all right, we're going to apply some sort of model to uh, to make sense of the data that we've collected. We'll of course make sure that uh, validate what uh, that our data is telling us what we think it's telling us. And then finally, we'll kind of implement uh, this uh, in the real world and you know take over the world. Every plan ends with profit. So collecting and data cleaning. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the data collection, and then Phelan will talk a little bit more about the cleaning and the actual mathematical processing of it. So uh, any, anyone in here ever done war driving? Ever? OK, 
Okay, war driving is actually legal, so you can admit to it. But I'm not your lawyer and I don't play them on TV, so don't listen to me. So um, we started with the Raspberry Pi 3 because every fun project starts with a Raspberry Pi. And then we connected an alpha antenna to it because we could force that into promiscuous mode to monitor whatever Wi-Fi signals we want to. And then we started out by running Kismet. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Uh, and then ended up writing our own collection script. So we collected about 30 days of Wi-Fi uh, wi signals from this one sensor that was sitting in my apartment at the time, uh, just watching the Wi-Fi spectrum around me. And what it's primarily collecting is this uh, skip column zero, because it's unnamed, an RSSI value that we didn't actually end up going back and collecting. Um, the name of the sensor that it was running off of, epic time, because I can always process that into a better timestamp later. Uh, the OUI, which is always in the BSSID, otherwise known as the MAC. Uh, then what we have here is a hash of the MAC address combined with the SSID and a salt. Um, and then the company name is associated with OUI. And then we break out the epic time into easily binned, binned values. So I could have stored all of that information as a timestamp that's human readable instead of just epic time. But if I go ahead and store this as five, five or six different columns, I'm immediately set up as we'll talk about with vectors later, to just switch from those columns straight into vectors and straight into different types of aggregations. So right now what we're talking about is basically your Raspberry Pi, Alpha Antenna, collect all the things. Next slide, please. So, por que no los Kismet? Um, why not use Kismet? Everyone uses Kismet for Wi-Fi, and Kismet 2.0 is awesome. It's got a web front end, and like it presents all this really valuable data. Unfortunately, what Kismet's gonna tell me is the number of times I've seen a hotspot, the first time I saw a hotspot, the last time I saw a hotspot, and the rough, ge the rough the GPS coordinate of the different times that I've seen it. What it's not going to tell me is every time I've seen it along the way and at what time hack that was. So for the kind of information we were trying to collect, we really wanted to get towards what we would call a pattern of life for a particular device. So what I need to see is not just the first time I saw it and the last time I ever saw it, I need to see how frequently it stayed in that same spot between that first and last time. So instead, we go to Scapy and we write a, a pretty easy script, and you can find Google stuff on how to do this. Uh, so we zero in on the beacon frames uh, with 802.11 and then whatever. Um, zero in on beacon frames, and then from there we say, if I haven't seen this in a minute, put a new login, or if there's some sort of change from the previous time that we've se seen it, even if it's only been two seconds, put a new login. And then we implement channel hopping so we can watch across all the channels. And now we've got a collection platform that's saying every device, as long as it's in my area, I'm keeping track of, the, of when it stayed and I get really granular down to about a 60 second gap of when it's walked out of my collection area. Anything you want to add here? Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so this is kind of our first, uh, first look at what we actually collect. So for each of our near an apartment, you can see on, uh, on the left-hand chart that most of these, most of the uh, signals we collect are the ones that are like right next to, to our sensor, right? Like things like uh, someone else's uh, <clears throat> home Wi-Fi, maybe the refrigerator, and then as it starts to tail off uh, towards the end, it's devices that kind of come in and out of the apartment complex, other people's cars, their uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, their phones. And so from this like initial swag, we're kind of looking at, well, maybe the delineation between a stationary uh, hotspot and maybe a mobile hotspot is like roughly like 5,500 uh, times that we've collected. So we're kind of using that and using that as our kind of initial uh, threshold for uh, distinction between those different two types. And some of you are already identifying the the weaknesses with that conclusion, and we'll talk through some of the weaknesses that we discovered as well. The other thing that we want to point out is this diagram on, I did pick up a laser pointer, on the right here. So this is actually my home Wi-Fi over that month that we collected. And this is, it's more apparent over a single day, but if you look closely, this is basically minutes of the day. So every minute of the day was given a value from zero to what, 500, uh, I don't know, <coughs> the 5,000th value or whatever that it is and then seconds of the minute. And so every time that we see something that falls into that particular index, a minute of the day and that second, uh, as an XY coordinate, we darken it based on the, the number of times we've seen it. So darker values are more common values. So what I end up having here uh, is this period of relative 
like relatively less density, followed by a 10 to 15 second of high density, 20 seconds of none, or not none, low, and then a high density period again. What this is showing you is even though my, SS or my own hotspot is responding to probe requests, you've got this natural beacon period that is not as dependent on the probe request it's interacting with. So I, my home Wi-Fi hotspot has this period where it starts out for about you know, five seconds of just monitoring and responding, and then it'll advertise its location, go back into monitoring, advertise, monitor, and keep repeating this process. So this is starting to lead us down to a couple different threads to pull is that I have a natural polling rate for a Wi-Fi hotspot, and then I also have some devices that I can monitor really, really well and I have consistent coverage of, and then I've also got devices that I very rarely see, but I've got a whole lot of them that are down in the five to 10 observation period. And again, I'm collecting observations on them at a minute polling rate. Um, so if I've only seen them one to 10 times, that means that I've only observed them you know, at, at one, maybe a 10 minute period kind of thing. So, next slide. So this is a, our, our hypothesis, right? We want to test, can we determine a pattern of light uh, using math, and then we want to be able to deduce uh, what type of device it is uh, without actually having to go up to it, like flip it over, like, hey, is this, is this uh, the MAC address matches up to like a Soho router, and then uh, categorize what that, uh, that device is from a distance. Right. And again, you'll see like why we want to do this in our application part. So we have two broad categories or uh, classifications. One is uh, the mobile hotspot that kind of moves around, such as your phone, uh, someone's uh, MiFi device, a car, and then stationary hotspots, people's uh, home routers. And we'll be primarily talking about hotspots for the rest of the talk. Many of the observations that we have from hotspots, which is simplified data collection, you can easily extrapolate out to handsets as well. You just gotta tweak your collection to target handset beacons instead of hotspot beacons. So, um, so at the crux of all this is pattern light. We, will, uh, we wanna use a vector to kind of paint that picture, to make a fingerprint of uh, what a device is uh, doing. And so that gets us to this, like what, what is a vector, right? So, this is what the uh, Google uh, dictionary definition of what a vector is. So um, we're not really talking about direction of flight or anything like that. What we're talking about in specific to math is, uh, next slide, um, a list and then each specific, uh, each specific uh, position of that list means something. So you can see from the, uh, the second half of the slide there that we have three different uh, vectors one is a home Wi-Fi uh, vector. One uh, is a is a fingerprint vector for a MiFi puck, and the third is for like a car. And so there are 24 positions there from 0 to 23, and each one of those represents a particular hour of the day. So, uh, like John mentioned, in our actual uh, data structure, it's for every minute. But just for the sake of not putting 5,000 a 5,000 uh, position list on one slide, we come down to uh, one hour. So. For example, in the home Wi-Fi, let's say over the course of a day, uh, we, oh, thanks. Over the course of a day, we see, I'm like, persistent video. Top button. Uh, okay. So, home Wi-Fi, so at midnight, we see, uh, we see a beacon 10 times, great, 10 times, and then we see it consistently throughout the day. We can be pretty darn sure that this is uh, someone's like home router that sits there uh, forever, doesn't move collecting it all the time. For someone's modified puck, all right, at midnight, this device is still here. At one in the morning, it's still there. And then sometime uh, at around eight in the morning, the value drops from 10 to five, which means, all right, maybe halfway through that hour, that uh, device left the range of my sensor. So we can kind of uh, assume like, okay, this device left the area around 8.30 in the morning, and then it's gone at nine, gone at 10, gone at 11, and then at, at noon, they come back for lunch or something like that. And then they go back to work or run errands, go see a movie, and then they come back at um, around 6 p.m. and then they're there for the rest of the night. So this might be something that like a work uh, MiFi puck that you kind of carry around for like work purposes. And then finally, a, a car, you know, uh, that only visits every so often, like you don't see it for most of the day, most of the morning, and then like at 2 or 3 p.m. stops by, Jody, 
you know, come, come to knock in, and then uh, you don't see it for the rest of the day. And there's also the, the assumption that for a car-like device that the Wi-Fi is only on when the car is, is powering it. So even if the car itself was there, then we'd only see that when power was being routed to the Wi-Fi hotspot. Okay, so after we kind of organize our, our data into some sort of structure, we have to be able to apply a label to it, right? So either it's either a mobile a hotspot or a uh, or stationary hotspot. So uh, in classification, there's two main, uh, two ways that we classify things: either a supervised learning method or an unsupervised uh, learning method. A supervised learning method uh, means that you know you have your parent hovering over you, saying like, "You did this right. You did this wrong. You did this right." wrong. You probably definitely did this wrong. And then an unsupervised method, uh, big boy, big girl rules like, okay, we're going to say like, we don't need you to tell me what this is, but I'm kind of going to figure out on my own uh, whether or not this is right or wrong. So we use for this a super, uh, sorry, an unsupervised alert machine learning method, um, notably called uh, clustering, where you take this, let's say this is our example data set, we can kind of intuitively see that there's one cluster, two cluster, three clusters, and then your metrics are basically uh, distance or neighbor, uh, neighboring characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. And so we start off by saying, you know what, we're going to use uh, a, a method called uh, uniform manifold approximation projection to, uh, to kind of start off. Next. And it didn't really turn out to mean anything. So when we first kind of ran this, like this, this like dispersion like, absolutely means nothing to us. Like we've got Wi-Fi devices kind of everywhere. Like and like home Wi-Fi devices don't really kind of fit neatly into one particular area. And so this is kind of what we're talking about uh, in exploratory analysis, where sometimes we apply the wrong uh, model or technique, and uh, we have to kind of just kind of use our, our best judgment to say like, hey, are we doing the right thing or not? In this particular case, we really did the wrong thing because uh, we didn't read the fine print uh, in the documentation for later that there are certain assumptions about our data that this particular that UMAP makes assumptions about. Most notably, that um, UMAP assumes that your data is a Riemann manifold, which is this like nice smooth uh, curve if you kind of plot it out, which this thing most certainly was not. So, uh, our but this was still a great learning point for us because we said like. There's a lot, there seems to be a lot of noise, like a lot of confusing reasons for why these things are associated together, right? Like, modified devices are here and here, but they're also like here, here and here as well. So maybe there's something, uh, there's a confounding factor that's polluting uh, that nice pattern we're looking for. So that, so then it leads, led us to looking up PCA. But what is this PCA sort of thing? So if I had to explain it to my grandpa walking back on the corner store with his car in a bag so he can get home and watch his stories, PCA is just a way to take uh, all the factors that you have collected, put them in, uh, mash them together, and then distill out the most important concepts uh, from that mishmash of factors. So the so this like nice uh, dog versus cat uh, example that we have here, uh, let's say we're we want to figure out the differences between, uh, we want to say this animal is a dog or is it a cat? So our two first factors we're going to use is like the height factor, uh, in this case color of, uh, of its fur, and then if you kind of use your imagination, look at it, think of this in three dimensions, uh, it's still kind of mixed up, but uh, it has more of an emergence. And then what PCA does is we're going to combine color, height, and weight all together, and then we come up with these things called principal components. And the principal components, they reduce, they kind of capture what makes the, uh, each data point so different, and then it disperses it out into this nice uh, sort of piece where we say, you know, okay, clearly all the cats are here together, and then all the dogs, uh, <coughs> the nice corgis of the internet, are all clustered off. And then, but we still have to make sure that, uh, from a mathematical standpoint, that this uh, information makes sense. So one of the uh, things about PCA is that it's trying to explain variance. It's, uh, and so we use this 
one graph here to show that uh, using just one principal component, we capture about 70% of the variance of why things are different in our data. And then we get to our kind of max saturation around 10 with 90%. Any more than 90% you really don't want because then your model becomes far too specific to your, the data you trained on and you can't cross apply that to other data that you might want to collect in different locations. And a layman's term example of that is if I make a principal component for every member of my data set, then of course I explain my entire data set. But what I'm really looking for are what the factors that they share in common um, that maximize my ability to explain my entire data set. So remember uh, earlier in our presentation we said uh, that, oh yeah, 5,500 uh, use should be good enough uh, to distinguish between mobile and stationary. Well, this is the result of our hubris. As you can see, like not a really great uh, classification for like threshold whatsoever. But uh, what we do see at least is all of the green dots are all the way off to, uh, to the right. So we're kind of like on the right track. So that was like pretty motivating to see. And so uh, we later on, uh, later on top of that previous graph, what was called uh, k-means clustering. So we we said, hey, we want three distinct groups uh, in our data set, and then uh, classify that automatically. Uh, we chose three because even though we promised you guys two, either mobile or stationary, we wanted to kind of say like, all right, these are high comp and definitely uh, stationary, high comp and definitely mobile, and then like in between we can kind of like play with that and kind of draw some additional insights. So uh, what was really encouraging was that all the stuff in this, uh, in this uh, red field here, uh, there were like looking at OUIs uh, and people's what they call the SSID, the, the devices, uh, we were like pretty sure that these were all like home Wi-Fi devices. So really great to see that uh, they are clustered off all the way to the right. And then all the things that we expect to move around a lot, uh, like cars, MiFi's, people's cell phones, came almost all the way to the left. So again, pretty, uh, pretty good to see. And all the stuff in the middle, um, we didn't have like a good explanation for why uh, it's it would vary like in a quantitative sense, but we'll talk a little bit later about what we learned from all this. So you almost have, you can almost speculate that with this that you have a fully mobile, a semi-mobile, and then a fully stationary uh, camp here with, as things start to blend into each other's groups, uh, some overlap in that. So like uh, the PS4 one, so we did some of this analysis, the raw data has more detail in it than the hash cleaned up data that's releasable. Um, so we're able to like look at SSIDs and see things like Nintendo Switches and PS4s and, and stuff in there that are using, that are generally staying in the same place, but are sometimes activating a hotspot for doing ad hoc communications, et cetera, which starts to explain a little bit of that middle, middle area where it's like, I'm acting like a mobile device, but I'm typically used at the same place that my parents let me be used or let me play my Switch every evening or something like that. Okay, so now that we So we have a few kind of uh, different use cases to talk to you guys about. All right, so we're going to talk through um, alerting, which is something that every single InfoSec professional understands in some manner. Uh, and something we'll talk through set theory, because I love set theory. Uh, then we'll talk through classification again a little bit, and then change detection. But first, next slide, please. What we learned about the Wi-Fi. So when Wi-Fi sends a beacon is a function of three different things. So it's a function, because I'm a math nerd, of its natural rate. Remember the slide we showed you where it has a programmatically determined, my developer said I'm going to advertise myself this frequently unless my setting is changed to not advertise my SSID and then I'm going to very quietly advertise myself instead of saying nothing. And then if a handset sends a probe that has the field basically designated as star wildcard, anyone, if I'm, a, if I'm a WAP and I receive a beacon frame that says anybody out there, then I'm programmed to respond to that. So that's going to cause me to send out a beacon frame as well. And then finally, if someone calls my name and says, are you my mommy and I'm the mommy, then I have to respond to it, right? So either, either the little duckling's like, any mommies? I respond and then says, are you my mommy? And I have to respond. So there are these three different things that cause, us, that cause a WAP to send out a beacon. Then on top of that, our ability to detect a beacon is fundamentally impacted by meat space, i.e. the real world, right? So it's an analog signal moving through the RF spectrum uh, communicating digital information. So 
if there's a wall between my sensor and the, and the WAP, the RSSI that's going to get communicated there and the signal strength is going to be impacted by the presence of the wall. But we have some of those effects that cascade through this entire function. If someone calls my name through a wall, it's harder for me to hear it. So sometimes I'm not going to hear it. But when I do hear it, I'm going to respond. And then the person listening for that response also has that problem. So this is one of the things we picked up that was affecting our ability to classify um, patterns of life for these devices is there's much more real world impact than maybe we initially assumed. So and then uh, like one natural solution would be to have like more sensors out there in various locations to kind of pick up on is it a just interference, is it a range issue, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As well as actually collecting the RSSI value. So Scapey can do that by the way, we just didn't end up implementing that. You don't pull that out of the 802.11 information. You actually have to pull it out of a frame called the prism frame, um, which describes the signal strength that it gets passed down in Scapey's object model. Uh, so it's doable, but it's a little wonky, so we just didn't get around to it. Next slide, please. All right, so we also learned about undocumented OUIs. So we had a lot of OUIs. We parsed them out of the max in our data set that were like, we're going to discover all sorts of new things about Audi Wi-Fi hotspots and Ford focuses and all this stuff. And we did discover a little bit of that, but nowhere near as much as we hoped for. Um, so it turns out that your Wi-Fi MAC address has a bit. It's the seventh bit from the left. It's a very specific random location, but it's in the RFC, called the locally administered bit. And this bit is always zero unless someone has flashed a new MAC address on top of the BSSID. Um, so what that means is anytime you have a locally administered, uh, or anytime you have a randomized MAC, you're most likely going to have a flipped locally administered bit as well. And anytime someone is spoofing a MAC address, it's going to flip that bit. So what we end up seeing by doing, going back and redoing some of our lit review is that a very high percentage of randomized MAC addresses end up in unalloc unallocated OUI space. So it's not documented, it's not registered to anyone. They're allowed to do that because they're randomized. And they also have their locally administered bit flipped. Uh, and increasingly with devices after 2014, Apple and a lot of other uh, device providers started working in Mac randomization by default. And so that disrupts our ability to collect without forcing the locally administered bit into our feature space. Uh, however, there still are some OUIs that weren't in our publicly available document of registered OUIs from IEEE. However, uh, so we could see they weren't in that document, but we could see that all their SSIDs were consistent in a way that would allow us to assume a device manufacturer, which is what the OUI is supposed to communicate. So Audi being an example, we saw a couple Ford cars and then a couple different mobile hotspot devices that were specifically that. We could see like, oh, this is most likely a Samsung or these devices are consistently coming from Verizon kind of thing. Next slide, please. And then an M and E. Yeah. That one wasn't pre planned. Uh, yeah. And, and, like, and this is like the way they do it. They, uh, they set that bit and uh, they kind of randomize it there and it sort of appeared as an unknown type device. We found a really fascinating paper that was like 300 pages long uh, that I'll reference at the end. That if you want to know about like whether or not Mac randomization protects you from uh, nation states, the answer is no, but the paper dives into it in detail. So alerting. All right, so we came up with three types of alert. Alert when a new WAP is discovered. So I'm sitting and I have, imagine for a second, that instead of having just one Raspberry Pi in an apartment, uh, I have a campus that I'm responsible for or a campus that I'm targeting. And so I've distributed sensors across that campus. And I want to start drawing insights from it. So the first simplest one I have is every Mac that I see, just period, no matter how frequently I see it, I put it into a log. And then anytime something new pops up that's not been in my log, and naturally because I'm writing in Python and I'm lazy, I'm going to keep it in a flat file because that could never go wrong. Um, anytime I see a new app, I'm going to cause an alert and I'm going to exhaust the sock because things are coming and going all the time. These have potential meaning. So if I'm on blue team, whenever I see a new app pop up, it could be a rogue hotspot. And because I'm being proactive, now I can immediately walk in on it and turn it off instead of having to pull out my Wi-Fi with a directional antenna and attach it to my laptop and look like a nerd walking around the halls being like, what student in my university just plugged in an illegal router? Um, I also, yeah. 
I also can potentially tell when a mobile hotspot enters the parking lot in the red team's van. If I switch this over, if I'm in a very controlled facility and I switch this over to looking at handsets instead, and red teamer comes in with their cell phone on and doesn't turn off as their Wi-Fi, if I have a very good, tight understanding of who actually works in my facilities and where cell phones are allowed to go and when they're allowed to go there and whatnot, I immediately know that a new person, or at least a new device, is in my facility. And this has incredible OPSEC uh, implications for the red team if the blue team is doing something this advanced. Now, most blue teams don't have the time or the money to do something this advanced. This is not expensive, but it is time intensive. And then if I'm a red team and I'm watching infrastructure, new apps potentially mean new infrastructure that I can potentially compromise. It also could mean a new person in the facility. Uh, if I'm watching for a particular target, it could be that they showed up. The next thing we've got is alerting when a specific WAP is observed. So this is very, very, very doable. However, it very seldomly has operational meaning unless I can closely tie that device to a person or situation. So once I can closely tie it to a person or situation, now having a distributed sensor uh, platform that says when it hits one sensor versus another gives me some kind of operational value. Uh, this also could be if I you know, cheat on a Wi-Fi fox and hound exercise at a CTF and like covered the town of Raspberry Pis before, ha before the like, exercise goes off, I could very quickly find the, find the fox. But most people don't have, you know, what, it's like 35 bucks per Raspberry Pi. Most people don't have the money to cheat on those kind of things. Uh, <laughs> speak for yourself. Alert when a known WAP or handset enters an off-limits area. So if I control the gain of my antennas precisely and I distribute my sensors accordingly, I can actually get a very detailed sense of am I watching a particular room, am I watching multiple rooms. And then I can say, like, cell phones are allowed in this half of the building, but Bob is not allowed to take his cell phone into this other half of the building. Or I can begin to use cell phone monitoring to tell when the migration patterns of my employees. This goes back to how's the corporate world using this. They're monitoring employees this way. It's happening. Ed Scudis has a great talk on it, actually. He does it to his employees. Um, you, he does it with his little automated office to greet them when they walk in the door, but he's still spying on them to do it. Um, <clears throat> So you can enforce a no cell phone policy. You can enforce physical access controls or at least audit physical access controls. You can tell when employees get in late or if I'm red team, I can find the VP's office or track his movement through the building or out of the building into his car and home kind of thing. So you can imagine the kind of nasty things I can do if I tie a device to a person and then can follow that device very easily. Next slide, please. Set theory. And then I'll pass it off to this. So set theory so box. There's a lot of simple calculations that we can do with sets by just simply doing set unions, intersections, and differences. Um, so, for example, one of the common InfoSec questions is, how do I know if my monitoring infrastructure is seeing everything that I want it to see? So, to solve that problem, instead of fighting with, you know, elastic stack, I'm going to make a set of all observed IPs by taking all of the IPs I've ever seen in my NSM and I'm just going to go into Python and I'm going to cast them as a set because Python knows how to do that. And then I'm going to do that again with my asset inventory by IP. And so now I've got two very well-managed hash table based data structures and I'm going to run A minus B, which Python's going to calculate almost instantaneously, and it's going to show me all the IPs that are observed but not on the inventory because A is observed and B is inventory. And immediately I know what I'm seeing, but that I'm not tracking in my asset manager. So that could be a rogue device, or it could be an out-of-date out asset manager. And then the flip side is B minus A, which are devices that I'm tracking, but I'm not seeing. And that's either going to be a gap in sensor coverage, or an outdated inventory, or a device that's gone stale when it shouldn't have gone stale. So how do we apply this to WAPs? Very, very similar manner. Uh, and I'll actually very shortly skip to, actually, let's go ahead to the the Venn diagram slide. If I want to apply this to WAPs, then I need to have monitoring at various different uh, campuses or geolocations where the intersection matters. So let's say I'm monitoring in New York, Austin, and Silicon Valley. If I'm seeing just one hit in Silicon Valley, that's just a worker. But whenever I see someone that in a short time frame hits in both Austin and Mountain View, now I have someone that's a little bit higher up in the chain because something caused him to have to be at both campuses 
within my time frame. Now, the longer the time frame, the less valuable this is. Longer the time frame, hey, it could be an agile developer who just did an analyst to analyst exchange or a coder to coder exchange there. The people I really want are the people who go to all my campuses in the shortest period of time. That is my biggest target, likely the COO in the middle of an emergency for this organization. Anything to add? So one of the, the only uh, two constants in life, change and maybe taxes. Yes? Who knows? But uh, what we're really interested in is not just where are we at at one particular point in time, because that, uh, the snapshot that we run through our model only gives us that one snapshot. What we want to know is over time, how do these uh, relationships and, uh, and clusters change? So if the cluster itself changes, that, uh, sorry, the classification of where the cluster belongs changes, maybe this device uh, isn't behaving the way we thought it was. Maybe we didn't collect enough data, uh, or maybe we uh, suddenly decided that we're going to change this device type to something else. Uh, there are kind of weird stories out there of people installing Soho routers into their car so that their kids can like leak off the, the car uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. I'm not really sure why they do that, but that's like one potential case. Hey, some of us have cars from the 90s, okay? Like. Maybe you do. Um, but then uh, what we also want to know is like when uh, if the, the relationship with the overall uh, data set changes, that might be a uh, interesting sort of thing to kind of draw out. So like if we have, uh, if a device is maybe broadcasting all the time, but now it's only broadcasting like uh, every hour or every so a couple hours, that itself is also a change, a, a change detection that we want to uh, want to find out about. And then, so that tells us, hey, is our target or uh, things that we're monitoring are really different, and do we need to adjust our security uh, protocols or processes to keep up? Next slide. Uh, so we talked a lot about uh, like different uh, applications of it. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about like, hey, what do we hope to do in the future? So one big uh, gap in all this is like, hey, maybe we should have uh, done a little more collection and now some of the, of the RISI value, the, uh, the value of how strong your signal is uh, relative to our sensor. So uh, I mean, the bottom line is like, you can't really uh, geotag or like kind of reassociate that one thing to someone without looking at uh, the, sen the strength of their signal. So like one example we talked about, we're going to talk about here is like, if we reduce uh, the signal, uh, the, the antenna gain of our sensor to like just say a checkpoint or like an area that we're going to, uh, or a choke point that we're going to analyze people through, now we can get to what Sean was talking about. We associate a device with a person. We don't have to worry about what everyone else's uh, uh, broadcast at that side is doing. Uh, we, uh, in the future, maybe also want to do something with randomized max. So try to figure out like, hey, is there a specific pattern of distribution to the random max that we're seeing? And then we can, might be able to kind of reverse back like what type of device that random Mac is covering for. Uh, like we also said, we're, we didn't split our data into like the usual test, uh, train, and validate uh, sets of data. Uh, but that was just kind of a factor of our limited data pool. Uh, so to be apply more uh, rigorous academic standards to this, something we definitely want to do in the future. Um, and then for this particular thing, we only use one sensor. If we were to use multiple sensors across multiple different locations, we can kind of show and track someone's move from place to place or how long they spend at like um, at Starbucks versus Home Depot. And then uh, obviously nothing is ever complete without using someone else's data to make sure that we have replicable and uh, we reach the same conclusion uh, using someone else's data to our method. These are some of our references. The, the huge paper that Sean was talking about uh, was this last uh, fingerprinting attack and countermeasures uh, paper. And a great read. We learned tons and tons uh, about Wi-Fi from that one particular paper. And uh, that's, that's uh, what we did, guys. So do uh, you guys have any questions? Yes, sir. Correct.
Yes, there are. So um, the ones that we know of are the ones referenced in that paper we just pointed out um, because they use several, um, I think they were government collected but open data systems that were designed to test their specific questions of does anonymization, et cetera, work. Um, so I think the French, a couple French cities opted into those tests and they made their data, data sets available. So if we were to go back and continue work, we would probably pull those and then look at them to see what we could, could learn on that. Uh, and if you want to find them, they're referenced in that paper pretty clearly. Uh, so that's the direction I would point you. We had to give these away too. All right, we got to give away these things, and we need trivia questions for that. Oh my gosh. Okay, so um, who here has taken linear algebra? Yeah, I got a couple. So who wants to explain eigenvalues and eigenvectors to this uh, this gentleman? Yeah, oh, we can fix that. We can totally fix that. Yeah. So yeah, go take some discrete math and some some linal, and it's beyond the scope of this talk, but yeah. Yes, sir. If you're going to share the data, it's absolutely a problem. And then, so anytime you're going to actually start talking about people, um, you start wandering into this territory that's called International Review Board territory, especially if you're with a university, um, where you're basically going to put out your, your research plan, your data collection plan, and talk about all the potentially like previously identified personal information. And you're going to submit it for an ethics review to see if you're actually unintentionally violating privacy, et cetera. Um, because we weren't collecting on people, and we weren't making any attempt to do uh, to collect on people on this one. Um, we didn't do that, and that's also why we sanitized the data um, with as strong of crypto as we could come up with. Well, not crypto, as strong of hashing as we could come up with, and um, we'll not be releasing the, the unsanitized data for people to, to look at. But because you asked two questions, you get an alpha antenna. Would you take this back? Uh, the other yes. giveaway we have to have, go ahead. Um, we have not. So we did all this in starting with Python for the data collect, and then we actually did most of our analysis in Jupyter using pandas. I personally use the Anaconda um, package manager for it. And did you use Anacondas or just do it? Uh, So we also, another common data science language, I'm loathe to say this, but you could use R if you really wanted to, it's vector data. Um, but R is not a real programming language because it starts at one with its indexes. So um, let's do that if you like pain. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, there, are, there are a lot of data analysis things out there. I'm a big fan of Jupyter for, for this kind of work uh, because especially if you're gonna present because it puts all of your docs uh, and your code in one spot. So for our, uh, for our analysis process, we use um, Plotly Express uh, to, so that we can like, easily tooltip through all the different points. Because if it's just a blob, like, there was no real way to kind of drill down to like, the relative position of each of those uh, data points as it fell uh, uh, when we did our PCA analysis. So like, being able to use uh, Plotly Express, uh, like, it was like, literally one line of code. I've got a good trivia question for giving away the book. It's not really a trivia question. It's a data science question. So, um, great question. Thanks. You have to ask two to get a book, though. Sorry. Um, so we're going to ask this question, and whoever can answer it most accurately first will give this packet analysis book away from No Sarge Press. Vanna White will, will demo it for you. Um, OK, so somewhat of a softball. What is, and Charles Arvey, you can't answer this. <laughs> I mean, unless you find it hard, in which case, go ahead. But um, what is the primary, like, uh, singular biggest limitation of k-means clustering? Or what's the hardest part of k-means clustering is another way to say that. I know you know the answer, but if no one else does. All right, Tori, what is it? Wait, what was that? 
basically the same thing, yeah. So how many k's you have, right? What, what k equals? So, but uh, you don't really need to pack it out. Neither of you does. Yeah. Okay, you have another question to give it away? That's, that's Mr. Williams in the back, right? Like, yeah, okay. They do complain about that. They don't have a big, furry, black and white library to use. Yeah. I would say knowing that you have a good test set for this. Hmm, getting closer. Getting very close. No, we've covered basically every phase except for the correct one. We're almost there. Okay, what's that? Hmm, no, close. Only applies to certain algorithms. What's up, Tori? Mm, that's that's one way to phrase it. Yeah, knowing what your problem is that you're trying to solve. Say what? Yeah. So I would vote that we give the people who tried hardest. Yeah, I think so. So. Good effort, guys. Appreciate it. All right, last call for questions. Thank you for coming to our talk. Sorry for being late. Y'all are wonderful. Have a great day.